Hi guys, here's a summary of chapter 6. Um, in chapter 6 we're talking about designing a customer driven market strategy. Um, and the four steps, and we did mention these earlier, the first step is to segment the market and that is where you divide the market up into segments. And there's a lot of different ways to divide the market up into segments and we'll talk about the different ways to divide them up but the key here is that they are segments that behave or, or act differently that react differently to different stimuli or there's there's some difference in the way these guys behave and we'll talk about more meaningful segmentation here once you segment the market then you target the market you decide which segments you're going to you're going to go after um, which market segments um, do we want to enter? Um, you're going to divide into a lot of segments. It doesn't mean you're going to go after each of those segments. So targeting is deciding which of those segments you're going to go after. Differentiation then is what do we do differently? How are we different than our competitors? Um, what value do we offer that uh, uh, what do we do differently? Sorry. Um, what do we offer that our, our competitors don't offer and it has to be something that customers value. And then the last step is positioning and this is what position we occupy in our customers minds. Uh, and we'll we'll talk about each one of those there. So this is um, um, what do we want them to think of when they when they hear our brand name or our company name. Okay um, the major uh, basis for segmenting markets is um, we talk about four main ways here. Um, geographic would be if you're separating things by by climate, for example, um, by local interest. Walmart sells different things in different places. Um, McDonald's menus are different depending on where you go. Uh, McDonald's you know, worldwide they sell different things in different places based on local taste and interest, but even within the United States the things they sell in the South, for example, are different than the things they sell in the North, so they do a lot of that. Um, but you customize offerings based on, you know, maybe the Walmarts in Florida don't stock snow shovels, but the Walmarts in Maine certainly would. Um, another one here, and this is a big one, is demographic, and there are a lot of ways to segment the demographic market. One here is age and life cycle. Um, one of the things here is you want to make sure that you avoid stereotypes. Just because somebody is in a, dip, a certain age group doesn't necessarily imply their life cycle. There are some older people that are very very active so you, you have to be careful not to group everyone in the same age group so life cycle might actually be more important way to do it. Um, uh, the example they gave in your book about um, set, uh, segmenting the market this way was cruises. And so the way a Disney cruise is offered is very different than um, I think it was a uh, Viking or somebody that was really high end. No kids, you know, look at the ads for those different ones. The one prominently fan feature families whereas the other one there's no kids involved in that one. So that's um, a very different market they're going after. Another way to segment the market um, demographically is by gender. Um, there's a lot of, uh, you know, toiletries, for example. Um, think about men's and women's shampoos. Most shampoos are, are specifically targeted towards men or women, or deodorant, or um, soap, for ev even. Um, and for a long time, these were mostly targeted towards women, but now you see a lot of men's ones coming out there. Um, Harley Davidson. Uh, for the longest time really just targeted men but now you see them uh, more aggressively going after uh, the, the women, the female market. So a lot of things are segmented that way and then income is a good one. Um, think about hotels. You've got low-end hotels that are clearly targeted toward low-income people and then really high-end hotels targeted towards high-end people. Um, stores would be the same way. The dollar stores uh, Dollar General, those kinds of things are clearly targeted toward a lower income range than um, Bloomingdale's or something like that would be targeted toward a higher income range. 
So those um, uh, are examples of different types of segmentation. There are a lot more different types of segmentation in there, uh, and your book has um, different examples of those, nationality, generation, um, religion, education, you know, all those types of things. So there's a lot of different um, ways to segment the market demographically. Uh, psychographic is a little more um, um, internal there. Uh, one way to do it is, let's see here, um, I have a lifestyle um, on psychographic. So lifestyle is one way to do that when like um, Starbucks versus Dunkin Donuts is a classic. They both sell essentially the same thing, marketed in a very different way, Have both have very loyal customers one way or the other. Uh, another example of that one would be um, like the zip car they have. They're clearly just targeted towards people who live in a very urban lifestyle. There's, temper there's little cars that will only go so far uh, that would not ever be targeted towards somebody in the suburban area. So that those would be lifestyle um, examples. Um, another one is personality. Again, we mentioned earlier a lot of times people like the personality of the product to try to match what they feel their personality is. Um, Mountain Dew might be an example of somebody who, who targets it that way. And then another uh, another way over here could be social class as well. Um, would be a, a way to market it um, based on psychographic. Different social classes have different things that are kind of acceptable for their for their what they feel their group is, their reference group. And uh, another way to segment the market is behavioral, and this is how or how often the customer uses the product. So you can separate it based on occasion. So um, orange juice was typically in the morning, and so only only consumed in the morning and so they tried different things to get people to consume it at different times. Um, Peeps is another one. So Peeps used to just be at Easter. So that was um, there's a lot of products like that that are holiday and now you should see Peeps for every holiday but Peeps are still pretty much a holiday thing. But they certainly expanded beyond Easter. Another way um, the people use the product behavior would be on the benefits received. And I think the best example of this is athletic wear or even yoga pants. Am I wearing yoga pants just to be comfy or do I need high performance things? So any of the sports wear. Do I want, do I want my sweats to really perform or are they really just lounge wear for me? So athletic wear is a good example of behavioral. Um, you can segment the market based on users. So you can have uh, first-time users or potential users or um, ex-users, people who don't use your product anymore. You'd like to know about that one. Um, regular users or even non-users. Are there things you can do to to make them become users? Potential users would be like um, first-time parents or wedding um, uh That's why you see like those wedding shows and that kind of stuff. Um, they're trying to get potential users in there. But um, I might I might want to really examine my ex users to find out why they're not using my product anymore. Um, I might treat my first time users a little differently because I'm trying to make them more loyal users. Another one is um, another way to segment this is users. You can have um, light users, medium or heavy users. Uh, cereal tends to do this. Um, uh, families with children tend to be really heavy users of cereal, so we'll market that one way. Uh, Burger King identified some really heavy users, and these were people that ate there like, I don't know, what did it say, like 16 times a month or something. And so they made special things for them to try to get them to buy even more. Uh, you can also do it by loyalty. Uh, Apple is a good example of this. And so we study our, our loyal customers and we learn about what it is they've got. Why are they loyal customers? What are we providing that other people aren't? And it helps us recognize what characteristics they value most. And so we want to make sure we, um, we can uh, continue to provide that. So that, those are very important things right there. Okay, so um, we We've segmented the market, and you know, and obviously we can segment it on a variety of these things right here. So we might be segmenting it on gender and usage, and so the, any combination of these or any of the other ones listed in your book, there's a lot, a lot of good, um, good ways to segment the market there. 
then we have to decide which one of those segments, which one of those market segments we want to enter, which one we want to go after. And we can't go after all of them. We're not going to have the resources to go after all of them. Um, so we want to make sure that the market segment is something that is measurable. For example, there might be a sizable market of left-handers, but it's going to be kind of hard to identify those guys. Um, there's not like census data doesn't ask people whether they're left-handed or right-handed. There's not a lot of data out there that we could go identify these people and, and go after them. So it has to be some sort of difference that we can measure. It has to be accessible. Um, if these people act differently, but I don't have a way to reach them, then it's not really going to help me. Do they shop in the same places? Because then I can reach them. Uh, do the people who meet this criteria um, read the same, see the same media, read the same magazines, um, uh, listen to the same, watch the same TV shows, um, something like that? Because then my ads can reach that group. If not, that's not going to be a group that's easy for me to get. For instance, the left-handers. Um, there's not, they don't watch different shows than anybody else, they don't shop in different places than anybody else, so it's going to be very hard for me to not just identify them, but then to access them. Because any any ads I place or any messages or any products are going to hit, hit as, just as many people who are not in my target market as are, so that's not going to be real um, easy for me to get to. It also has to be um, substantial enough for it to be profitable. It doesn't have to be huge, but it does have to be profitable. And uh, I think the example they gave in your book is cars for people that are over seven feet tall. It would be a lot of work to make a car for seven feet tall. It would be very expensive to make, to, to rearrange, to re-engineer the entire car to do that for a pretty small market. So it would be really, really expensive to provide that product. Probably not enough people in there to make it profitable for me, which is why you don't see that. Um, it also has to be differentiable. Do these people respond differently? Um, for instance, uh, let's go back to the left-handers, and I'm selling um, Morton's table salt. Do left-handers behave any differently with the salt than right-handers? They don't, so it wouldn't make any sense for me if I'm selling that to differentiate the market that way. And it also has to be actionable. Can you attract and serve them? Just because it's a difference doesn't mean it's something that you can actually um, uh, provide them with what they need. Can you can you feasibly make a difference for this group and, and serve them well and provide them with what they value? So those are things we want to look for when we pick a market. Okay, um, once I've decided to do that, um, you also want to look at that segment for uh, the size that they are and the, the, the growth potential. You want to look at um, the structure of the market. Uh, if there's a lot of competition in there, then maybe I don't want to go into that one. How much power the buyers or suppliers have. And, and also, well, you want to make sure that's going to mesh in with your current company resources and objectives. Um, so strategies that we can have, you can have an undifferentiated. So this would be one offer to all your customers. Uh, this would be, for example, like the salt, the, the table salt. Um, you don't see a lot of different varieties of Morton's table salt. You got the one thing, you got the one message, and I just deliver the exact same product and message to everybody. There's not a whole lot of products that can do it that way, but salt would be a good example of that one. Uh, differentiated. Look how many different types of laundry detergent Procter & Gamble offers. Um, and they, each one is designed to appeal to a different market segment. Some are based on cost, some are based on quality, some are based on uh, lifestyles and interest. If it's, you know, um, uh, uh, free of dyes and chemicals, you know, it's a little bit greener. Or this one's designed towards babies for, for that demographic market there. Or Hallmark has a bunch of different lines of cards now. They're all under the Hallmark name, but they're, you know, they have the funny ones, and then they have the value ones, and they have a, a, the religious ones, and so each one's appealing to a different group. A lot of products are offered this way. You also have concentrated, where I'm just offering one, um, I, I picked a very specific target market that I, so, so Procter & Gamble is still going after everybody, but they have different products to go after these different groups. Concentrated, you're really only going after one group. 
So Whole Foods would be an example of that. They are going after a very specific type of customer going after grocery shopping. Or um, if you see uh, um, Etsy, Etsy, whatever it is, uh, they sell um, all handmade things. Um, it's, it's promoting small businesses and handmade and very customizable kind of things. So that's a very concentrated market. Micro would be a, an extreme example of concentrated. This is where you vary the offer in each lo location or to each individual customer. Sorry. So if the if what I offer is different to each individual, uh, that's still not right. <laughs> Sorry, individual. Uh, then that would be micro marketing. So. Um, if your uh, messages that pop up on your phone based on your phone knowing where you are, oh, you're driving past the sheets, here's a coupon for sheets, that would be micro-marketing. Or if you offer a different product, um, so some of the computers, it's Dell or whatever, and they offer a very specific, um, each person gets a, their own version of that computer, that would be an example of um, micro-marketing. Okay, um, we also want to talk here about um, differentiating and positioning. Sorry about that. Okay, just real quickly, um, different ways we can differentiate ourselves from our competitors. We can differentiate based on product, like Subway. They're fast food, but they're a different version of, of fast food, so we can do it on, on product. We can do it on service that we offer. Um, banks try to differentiate themselves here a lot. I think another good example is that Honda place in Greencastle. Uh, so if you go in for your oil change, they have a they have a like a a cook there. They have a little cafe. Um, I know people that go there. They schedule it in advance. They all go together, and it's like a day out for them. Um, uh, so that's that's a very unique way to differentiate yourself based on service. Um, you can do it on channel. There are places like Amazon and Geico that sell only online. So the where you make your product available, you can make yourself, um, you can differentiate yourself that way. You can do it on the people that offer your product. I think Disney is a great example of this. They have awesome customer service pretty much anywhere you go in the parks. And um, you know, from the guy that's checking your bags when you go in to the people working the rides, I mean, so they really emphasize that quality customer service everywhere throughout there. You can also differentiate yourself based on image, like the Ritz Carlton. I mean, the word Ritzy comes from Ritz Carlton, and so they separate themselves based on really, really high class, the image that they present there. Um, uh, the difference that you make, though, needs to be something that is important to your buyers. Just because you're different, they, there's some hotel in Japan that market themselves as the tallest hotel in the world, which they were, and that set themselves apart as different, but it wasn't a difference that mattered to the buyers, and so they, it didn't get them any additional sales or it didn't increase their profits because it wasn't something that people cared about. So whatever difference you pick, it has to be something that is of value to, to your customers. It has to be distinctive enough for people to notice it, it has to be something that you can do better than anybody else. So, for instance, if you want to um, promote your, or different yourself based on people, you better make sure those people are well-trained and happy employees to be providing that. It has to be communicable, so something that your people can, you can explain, here's why we're different. Uh, so they can, it's something that sets, that you can do, but also that you can explain what, what's different about you. If it's something really technical, that becomes harder to do. Uh, you want it to be preemptive, which means that your competitors cannot easily copy it, and that can be tough. Sometimes um, it gives you an advantage for a while, but if other people can easily copy it, then that tends to go away. It has to be affordable, to your customers, and it has to be something that you can do and still be profitable. So sometimes that's why other people haven't done it, because you can't do it profitably. And then the last section here is positioning. This is in the minds of your consumers. In class, I give um, we do a little exercise 
with ice cream and we name all these different brands of ice cream and I say okay what's the first thing that pops in your head when you think um, Briars and most people say like all natural or something like that um, uh, what's the first thing you think of when you think of Ben and Jerry's and so they're all like funky with the crazy names and that kind of stuff so whatever that first thing that people think of when they hear that brand name or that or that company name that's the position you occupy in their minds I think of them as a really good value. I think of them as really um, consistent quality. I think of them as um, really fun. That's the positioning. And they uh, outline a couple different um, major categories of positioning in your book there. You've got the more for more, which is um, yeah, I'm up, you're paying more, but I'm getting more. Okay, so upscale hotels, luxury cars, that kind of stuff. More for same is you're getting more, but you're paying the same, like Lexus. That's their that's their positioning. Uh, same for less means you're getting the same value or the same quality, but for less money. So that would be Walmart, David's Bridals, those types of things. Um, you're getting less but you're paying much less. That would be Sam's Club, Southwest Airlines, that kind of stuff. So it's kind of bare bones, but you're, it's worth it to you to save money in there. And then the other possible strategy is more for less. You're getting more, but you're paying less. That's really, really hard to sustain. Uh, Home Depot tried that, and, and I guess for the most part they still are, but that's a really tough one to, to sustain profitably. So there's a summary of Chapter 6.